All right, so I'm going to share um, some details uh, about Photon. Photon is kind of my attempt to bring seedlet um, uh, components or like a toolbox to, to allow other wallets, uh, other open source wallets to kind of leverage uh, seedless key management. The, the concept is kind of stolen from, from the Casa uh, mobile wallet. They have a very similar setup. And this is kind of like something for the open source community that they can build on. And obviously also with um, a, an intention to do UX research around this and just better understand the user interaction models and things that, that uh, are made possible um, with this. I think if we look at where we are today uh, with in terms of key management, um, it very much reminds me of kind of the old PGP days of key management. Like um, in, on email encryption, you had to like, you had to, you know, manage ASCII armored uh, key blocks and uh, verify key fingerprints. So it was, it was very kind of technical. And it was only when, when um, Signal came around that they kind of wrapped that key management so public keys were just fetched automatically from a key server and the user didn't have to manage that. So that Signal made kind of that accessible for encrypted messaging. But I think where we are today with, with uh, key uh, management is the user basically has two, two choices. Um, he can keep the coins on the exchange, which has one set of risks, right? Or he could learn to manage a seed phrase and which has another set of risks. It, the, the, the exchange is the user more of kind of like a banking experience uh, with the downside of the potential exchange getting hacked. A really big one um, is SIM swap attacks. We, we saw um, uh, especially one person share that they had lost over $100,000 worth of Bitcoin from their Coinbase account um, because they, they had their uh, phone number stolen. So basically an attacker took ownership of their phone number by doing a social engineering attack uh, at their mobile provider. With that, was able to kind of um, reset uh, the user's Gmail password over his phone number, and then also uh, reset his Coinbase password um, over, over his uh, email. And the fact that basically our whole online identity is tied to our email address, I think is an inherent um, security issue, but all exchanges basically uh, face this. So um, it's definitely a pretty big risk for, for end users there. Um, managing a seed is also, I think, quite complex. It's, it's a pretty big barrier that newcomers would have to kind of get over to um, explore this like new uh, world of Bitcoin. I think we underestimate how, like for us, it's very normal to write down these 24 words on a piece of paper. But I think once you start actually putting large uh, sums of value behind that seed, um, you have to think about redundancy like how I mean, do I do I store that piece of paper in multiple geographic locations? If I do, do I then have to think about security? Like, do I set a passphrase? Uh, where do I store that passphrase? So there's all these all these kind of management uh, questions that every user has to go through, which is quite um, I think a big ask of of newcomers. And I think we can do better. Um, we, so what we learn is that a lot of users opt for the exchange risks, right? Because they trust the exchange more than they trust themselves, which um, I think is very telling. It, it shows that we were not really, like as developers, we're not doing the best job that we can. I think, I think we can get to the state that the encrypted messaging world got to with a signal and I think we're, we're, we're just learning how to do that. We're just very early. Um, security nihilism is something that is brought up in the IT security space quite a bit. It was, it, it keeps being mentioned by Alex Stamos. He was, uh, he was uh, leading security at, at uh, Yahoo and, and Facebook. He was a big proponent of end-to-end -end encryption when he was working there. And he kept pointing out that we need 
to be more empathetic to the end user uh, in the security um, community. And a lot of people in security like fall victim to security nihilism. So security nihilism is, just read it out, is it a set of beliefs that includes the assumptions that all attacks are perfect, that everybody faces the worst possible threat scenario, or that any compromise to make a security feature more widespread should be considered bug. And what's what's really important here is if you consider that like Signal actually reduced the the endpoint security because it automatically fetches those public keys. You could consider that reduction in security, but it turns out like PGP. I think the strong set of PGP keys was around fifty thousand. If you look at the the SKS um, servers and the and the um, the web of trust, and but the, in terms of internet, that's a very small number. Whereas like um, with Signal now, the Signal protocol is obviously in, in WhatsApp and in other messengers, and WhatsApp has 3 billion users, right? So all of a sudden, we, we were able to make um, end -end encrypted messaging available to a large part of the population. And I think that we shouldn't forget how powerful that is, and I think we do the same with Bitcoin. So I think we just need to ask better questions. Um, we need to ask... Can we make it easy for newcomers to secure small amounts? I think if we if we just um, allow users to get their feet wet uh, and and not kind of put those twenty four words in their face, I think we we have a good starting position. And I I also with this pr project I tried to think more deeply about can we actually engineer a better user experience and and better security than custodial solutions and i think we can um we just have to think about uh mitigating sim swap attacks and uh, finally i think it's important to as the user add more value to their wallet to basically upsell additional security features over time as the funds grow because the the security that you need to secure a hundred dollars worth of bitcoin is very different once you get into the tens of thousands. Um, and I think we can like we can work on that kind of scale and like uh, try to, you know, in the UI say, oh, you just like because the wallet knows how much the user has and can say, hey, like you just added a bunch of value. Do you want to add this feature maybe uh, to, to add security? And my attempt at this is something I call the, the Photon uh, SDK. So it's this open source wallet toolbox. The primary goal is to explore the UX and security trade-offs and kind of figure out what those new best practices could be. Kind of like figure, like make that leap to the, the, the signal uh, type of um, accessibility in terms of um, making the security accessible. Um, so it's fully open source. It's it's written right now. It's written in in JavaScript uh, for React Native. So it works on both iOS and Android. But um, there's definitely if there once we figure out like the the interaction model, security models, and there's there's real interest from the the community. Um, we'd also love to. Uh, to write native modules for this because obviously um, wallets are written in all sorts of languages. And the components are there's a key server, um, which um, I'll get into later. Then there's a, a client module, uh, which is called PhotonLib, which is what the wallet developer would integrate into his, his wallet to make seedless backup possible. And then finally, there's also a demo app, which I'll show later, which kind of shows off and documents how to integrate uh, the stuff. Um, the seedless, the two of two seedless backup is basically very similar to how the, the Casa mobile key works. Um, I really like what they did in terms of making key management more, more accessible. And I wanted to bring that to kind of the open source uh, community and have that be just a, another component that somebody can integrate if they wanted that similar uh, type of UX, right? So you have one, uh, the encrypted seed is stored on 
the user's iCloud or G Drive account. And what's really interesting here is the on the mobile device, the users always log already logged into their uh, like Apple account. So there's no like there's no UI flow that the user needs to go through to actually store some some encrypted value, which is super valuable in terms of um, uh, user experience. So there's no need to sign up anything, which I, I think is great because Bitcoin doesn't have a, a login, right? I, I, I wanted to retain that um, quality about Bitcoin. There should not be the need to, to, to log in or create an account with an email address. And then the, the second part is there's a key server which stores and manages the encryption key um, which is used to encrypt the, the seed phrase. So only when the, the user installs the wallet app and authenticates to the key server, is he able to download the encryption key and then also download the encrypted seed. And with those two assets, he can um, re recover his funds and recover his wallet on his device. The the way that the key server authentication works um, is, is it does not require, like the way CASA did it, CASA requires you to create a, uh, an email, a password login. And I, I wanted to uh, prevent that. So in the very first step, what actually happens, there's a random key ID that is stored on the, the user's iCloud or Google Drive. This is kind of their username. It's completely random uh, UUID. And the user, the only thing the user needs to do is remember a, a pin, so a short pin. And this pin is used to do rate limited um, authentication to the key server. The key, like the key server, um, stores the 256 bit encryption key. So for kind of your UX bang, uh, you, you, get a, you get a lot of security bang for your UX bug. Uh, because um, what a lot of wallets do is they use either a pin or a passphrase to derive a key on the device, which has very low entropy and can easily be brute forced. And with this concept, we actually have a high entropy key, which encrypts the seed, and we're using rate limiting and server side uh, security to ensure that that key does not get compromised. And what actually happens is if I enter the, the a wrong pin, 10 times, the server will uh, will lock that key for seven days. And that gives basically us, it takes two, about 2,000 years to brute force a, a six-digit pin, which I think is, is great security um, for the fact that the user only really needs to remember six-digit key. Uh, sorry, a six-digit pin. And this is, um, I hope you guys can see this. This is the, um, the kind of the, the wallet. A demo. Okay, cool. So let's assume this is like my current device, and like, and this is like my new device, right? So that I'm currently on my iPhone eight, and I'm setting up, I'm setting up my new wallet, and it's asking me to, sorry, it's asking me to set a new pin. So um, I say, okay, I'll just, I'll just uh, set this one and ask me to verify. And what it does now, it creates a backup. It, it encrypts that's my seed, puts it on iCloud, creates a key, um, stores it on the key server, and uh, boom, we're done. So that's all the user needs to do to basically be onboarded. They don't need to write down 24 words, but they're still like, they still have full custody of their funds. And um, now, you could you could ask okay what happens if the user forgets their pin right so what what there is there is a an option to um, set a recovery email address this is purely optional well, I'll, I'll just go ahead and do that and then it'll ask me for my pin and I'm actually going to get a, an email here to my my normal email address. What I what I do obviously is I, I verify, uh, just like with Signal or other messengers, verify that I own that account. And it says it's verifying the email. 
and boom. So my my recovery email is set. But again, this is purely optional. Um, this should not be something that like Bitcoin doesn't have a login. So this is only uh, this this is something that the wallet could like once there's a certain value, it could say, hey, maybe you should set a recovery. Um, and grab your email in case you you forget your pin. And now let's let's basically assume that this device I actually lost this device. So my my iPhone eight basically drops in the toilet, uh, and and I I can't access my my wallet here anymore. And then I, I I buy a new iPhone, right? I log into my Apple iCloud, and I install Photon, and then I start it up. And it asks me, okay, do I want to restore my wallet? And it just asks me for my PIN. It says uh, restoring wallet. And there we go. I have my, my funds back, right? And the, the cool thing here is like, it, it's, it's, it's super easy and it, there's nothing else that the user really needs to, needs to do. There is, um, let's say that I, Let's say I forgot my pin. So let's say I like right. I I buy a new phone. I just can't forget the pin. What I can do here, there's this forgot pin feature, which um, leverages the recovery email. So I'll just click that, and then it says starting a pin reset. And what happens here? It it will ask me to verify that I own my recovery email address. And and then I'll I need to verify that. Oops. Oh, sorry. Just asking me for my pin. Wait. Ah, I entered the wrong one. That was the, the previous email. Sorry. And then it tells me that the pin reset was initialized. And in order to actually mitigate a SIM swap attack, it locks the pin reset for 30 days. So it's telling me here that I need to wait until uh, August uh, 19th to, to, um, to reset my pin. And the, the reason it does this is the attacker, usually when the attacker steals your phone number, um, they only have a limited time window until the user notices that they've lost access to their online accounts. And we assume here that within 30 days, the user would notice, okay, I've lost access to my phone number, my Google mail, and would then go to their mobile provider and get those assets back. So the attacker wouldn't, wouldn't have the time to basically steal the user's funds and that would be protected. All right, and so the, the the this is the about the the time delay pin recovery. Again, this is purely optional in case the user wants to uh, share their email address. The the key server actually doesn't doesn't uh, store any personal information uh, in clear text, so it actually does a an escrow hash of the email address or phone number, um, and it. it Use a random a seed, so a uh, random um, salt, so it, it can be brute forced either. Um, so there's actually um, that the email address is only used for that verification one time. It's actually not stored. Um, and yeah, so this is something um, you can do. Like Photon supports phone numbers and email addresses in case the user forgets the pin. Uh, you'd have to verify it, just like Signal. And it has the, this 30 day time lock to mitigate the SIM swap attacks. And after the 30 days, the user can just set a new pin and then just work, uh, go from there and recover their funds. Um, so this is the, the kind of the roadmap. I, I have in my head, but I'm like super open to um, any suggestions if people from the community are interested in this. Uh, the idea is to ship like a version one demo app on test flight do a bit of user testing with that, get some feedback from the community, uh, like how they feel about like the security trade-offs 
and just the whole also the privacy model. And then um, next, I want to add something like the, the secure the health checks. So backup integrity checks, where um, the wallet will after like let's say every ninety days, it will send you a notification, and it will make ask you to make sure that all of the assets that you need for recovery are still there. So it'll check your iCloud if the encrypted seed is still there, and it'll ask you to enter your PIN to see if you can basically uh, practice a recovery. Um, and then uh, another security feature that we could add in that kind of like upselling strategy is two-factor authentication on the key server. So um, two options here are, are Google Authenticator or actually physical UV keys. Um, that, would, that would add basically yet another layer of security in case, uh, let's say the user all of a sudden has uh, thousands of dollars worth of Bitcoin. Um, that would be something that the, the wallet could could ask the user to add in terms of security. Uh, and I'm also super interested in having like a seedless multi-sig um, kind of toolkit, um, similar to, to what Casa does, but actually available as like an open source component where uh, wallets could uh, actually use this. So you would have like hardware wallets, uh, the, the mobile app as like one key in that multi-sig setup, and then also a server recovery key, uh, which is kind of like a either a, as a two of three or a three of five setup, depending on whatever the, the app would want to do. And I think there's a lot of stuff we can explore there. Like the way that Casa does it is there's only one mobile key app and the rest is hardware wallets. I think it would also be super interesting since a lot of users have multiple mobile devices. So there's people who have iPads, they have phones. Like another way we could do this is actually uh, multi-sig with multiple uh, seedless mobile devices uh, where if I have two or three phones lying around, I can just like, I need two phones to like sign a transaction, something like that. Um, but yeah, th these are all things that we could explore. Um, and then depending on when and, and how big the, the interest is from the, the, the community, um, because uh, wallets are written in all sorts of languages for iOS and Android, um, I'd be super interested in, in having uh, native libraries in Swift, Java, Kotlin, what have you. And uh, finally, shout out to, to Square uh, Crypto for funding this work. I'm super, super grateful to be able to work on this. This is uh, kind of my dream job to, to explore uh, the Bitcoin key management and see what we can do in terms of UX. And with that, um, thank you and uh, questions. Hey, great, great demo, Tankred. Um, uh, yeah, I'm working on a project now which uses Ionic, which is very similar to React. And uh, we managed to ship a Android and iOS build with the same code base with no, no if Android, if iOS, other than the build process, it's, uh, it's all the same code base. So it's definitely doable. Um, and for apps like this, uh, web tech is definitely the way to go. I don't know if you will need to go native. Um, and even if you do, you could always write your own plugin. Um, as far yeah. as the usability, I, I, I think you're onto something there with just having to know a pin. I mean, if, try explaining uh, a bib seed to a no coiner, and they'll just their eyes glaze over. So I think that's that's worthy. Um, everyone can understand a pin. So I think you're onto something there. Just build out that UI. Um, obviously, you, you need to make it look slick, though. Like the graphics, the icons, all that matters. Unfortunately, yeah, like yeah. we all we all on this call know that the the guts behind it is the hard part, but the front how it looks is going to be important as well. So, um, just for don't, sure, for don't, sure. Yeah. Don't yeah. The the UI. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So yeah. Great. Excited. Hey, uh, thanks Brett. I, I had a question, Tancred. Um, so I, I wasn't quite clear for the key server. Is the idea being that somebody would have like a hosted key server or is this something that you know, maybe users or, you know, family of users would host. So what's your thinking there? Because I assume that your security is that you know the PIN and you also know your password and you know, 
you know, the password for your cloud hoster, right? But is it also like, is it, um, like is your, I, I assume your, your key is not encrypted on the key server? You're saying? So the, the, the way that the key server works, it's um, actually just uh, written with serverless uh, Lambda, Lambda functions. So anybody, it's, it's also open source. Anybody can like host their own. And it's super cheap to host because Lambda actually bills you for API calls. And since actually the restore and the setup phase is um, something that almost never happens um, in the user lifecycle, you basically, it's basically for free, right? I have yet to be charged one cent for all the, like the testing I'm doing right now. So that's the cheap and like, um, yeah, all, all, all you need is an AWS account and you can kind of host your own for your own wallet. Um, but I would like to have some sort of um, develop, like just for developers who want to like play around with this. Um, I, I have one set up for myself, but I, I, I would need to like make sure that, you know, people don't use this to spam other email and whatever, but like just have that set up that developers can play around with it before they have to deploy their, their own keys over. Yeah, cool. So the company that is creating the wallet um, would be hosting the key server, is that correct? And and not like the user? Yes, yeah, the, the wallet uh, the wallet developer would host the key server um, and and kind of like manage updates. And the idea is to have like a common open source key server where you know we can share the work around like security audits and and um, just making like sure that there's enough review on, on this component and then like all these different wallets could share that uh, kind of effort there also needs to be twilio or something like that as well right for the sms verification correct yes uh, the the key server uh, uses twilio for sms uh, but uh, the, in the current demo actually uh, went with uh, email because i think that just is I don't know, um, a lot more people use email. And I've, I've actually talked to a bunch of users and asked them, hey, would you prefer your phone number or your email? And especially nomads, they they change their phone number like every time they change a country. And so people seem to uh, like uh, the email address. It seems something that's more sticky and it's also something to secure um, with two-factor. Two so people seem to like email better. Uh, what's like in terms of like uh, cross compatibility with other wallets, right? Could um, somebody else who uses your uh, SDK will it be will I be able to recover my wallet from a Photon wallet and a different wallet that uses your SDK? Um, so the way that um, iCloud a key value so this uses iCloud key value store or on Android, it uses the, the Google Drive API. And the the access is only to, it's, an, it's a per app access. So like app A can't access the key value of app B, right? So that, that's definitely very tight security uh, there. What we could think about doing is at least like, at least have like a common standard uh, format for this backup. And that's definitely, that's definitely a deeper uh, conversation around security that we need to have uh, if it would make sense to share that between wallets. I would assume that by default, we want to restrict it as much as possible. Um, but theoretically, it could be done. Uh, we would just need to um, you know, write to a, a, a common folder in Google Drive or something where then multiple wallets could um, who that also have the same key server obviously could could store backups. Cool. Um, like what in what what part of the app of this whole flow are the seed keys being encrypted? Is it inside the wallet? Is it inside the uh, Google Cloud? Or yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So all the all the encryption happens on device. Um, the seed is. Is stored on the secure enclave, so the the uh, and the device uh, 
the the the, the only place the the seed is actually stored is in the hardware security module of that uh, iPhone or Android device. It, it, I use React Native Keychain, which leverages whatever hardware security that device has. Um, if you have like a Pixel device, it uses the Titan M security module. Um, on iOS, it just uses the, the I, uh, iOS Enclave. And um, the encryption happens on device, and only the encrypted seed is then uh, sent to, to iCloud or Google Drive. Nice. Uh, if I wanted to, could I get the seed keys from your wallet? So developers can, if they want to, they could surface the 24 seed words. And CASA does this, and they call this sovereign uh, key recovery. So I think I think this is something definitely that users should kind of do, in, uh, or wallet developers should do in the advanced settings to basically have uh, like sovereign recovery so that you can get those seed words. If let's say that the, the person that hosts the key server, so the key server goes down or the iCloud goes down, you can still recover your funds. What Casa does in that case, they say, they assume that their user base doesn't know how to securely manage a key. So they mark that key as compromised once you do display the 24 seed words. I don't know if we need to go that far with this, but that's definitely something I would put in the advanced settings where, you know, only users that know about this can, can access it. Um, so, I have, yeah, go ahead. A go question. ahead. Um, so why, why is it an SDK and not just a wallet that if anyone wants, then they can just fork the source code? Um, well, yeah, like it, so the, 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 the idea is definitely to build a wallet. Um, and that's kind of like the, what my next step is, is to, uh, have that kind of demo wallet, um, be something that's actually a wallet that people can just use. So, um, yeah, but the intention is to have like this as a reference app also that, um, to kind of promote the, the whole seedless security, uh, just like signal is now basically the, the, the best practice standard in, in, um, uh, in all of the, the messenger apps because it just scales in terms of UX. And it, that's kind of the idea to, to have something that could scale to other wallets. Okay. And um, if there was a malicious like wallet dev who wanted to mm -hmm. just steal everyone's funds, um, so I guess they could easily brute force the um, recovery key, right? Because they, they wouldn't be rate limited. Um, so the 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 attacker would only have access to the um, the encryption key on the key server, not the actual encrypted seed. So the the user only the user on their device is able to like download the, the encrypted seed uh, from iCloud. Okay, um, so I guess that dev would also have to like compromise the user's email. Um, yeah, they, they'd have to get access to their iCloud account. That's a, that's, I actually wrote a, a threat model document uh, on GitHub. I, I maybe you should share it um, where I, all these, all these kind of attack vectors are discussed. Like what happens if an attacker, like attack would need access to um, iCloud so that he uses iCloud account, their, their key server. And, um, and like how the steps that we take to kind of negate an attacker getting access to all those attacks. Okay, Steve already shared it. Thanks. But, okay, but um, like a, a malicious dev could easily know the email, and it's just a, and even I guess the phone number, and it's just a matter of a SIM swap attack, right? Um, well, the the dev, well, look, if the if the, if it's a compromise on the wallet developer level, like it doesn't really matter anyway, because like right now, any mobile wallet could. Any mobile like Red Wallet or or Blockstream Green, they could just uh, send a malicious update in their in their app store and steal the users' funds. So that like threat isn't like new. Um, you you wouldn't actually need uh, you all you need to, to do is ship a malicious uh, update and just grab the user's private key off their off their mm -hmm. phone. Um, 
So yeah, I, that would probably be even be cheaper and easier. Um, and another thing is that I I would think that it's actually probably easier to brute force a six digit pin than a four digit pin because if it's six digits, then most users are just going to pick something super easy, like zero 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 zero, <laughs> and yeah. and like guessing. Whereas four digits, it's more likely that they won't pick like something easy. So I'm just. Yeah, either that or like their birthday or something. So probably a lot easier. Okay, correct me if I'm on. Okay, good. But the since this is an SDK, I think you've made it configurable or parameterized, right? So the wallet developer can choose whether it's four or six or eight digits. Um, and, and we might see a variety of different experiments and different user experiences from different wallets using the same library. Yes, yeah. So the but that's really good feedback. I, I didn't think of that with the four digits. Oh uh, yeah, the the uh, the key server supports anything um, larger than four digits. So the the key server also supports uh, like high entropy passphrases. So a wallet a wallet could also um, allow you know, like integration of a password manager, where the password manager just you know like one password generates your random password, stores it in one password. And you need that uh, as a pin, so that's that's also possible. Uh, but yeah, the, the four-digit pin is definitely really good feedback. I actually didn't even think of that. That that's probably going to be more secure. The I, I also uh, calculated the security. I think that's about 19 years. It would take 19 years to brute force um, four digits because of the, the seven-day delay. Mm. And, and it, does it accept fingerprints too? Like, um, the fingerprint would be possible once you actually have recovered the key. So on your device, um, wallets usually use this to just unlock the, the the wallet on the device. Like after the user basically has set it up, uh, we we could um, we could. Uh, like Apple has now um, joined the, the the Fido Alliance, and so you can now actually use that the iCloud um, the Face ID and the, the Touch ID as a Fido U2F uh, authentication device, like as a physical security key. So we could theoretically explore that just using the fingerprint as a two-factor um, authentication method, uh, either on top of the pin or uh, replace that to to authenticate to the key server. So that that would be something worth exploring. Uh, the problem there is that would be bound to the device. So you can't share like that. You like if if I on on device A I set up a fingerprint. I would also need to set up device B. So I would need to set up multiple devices in order to like authenticate to the key server. So. Hmm. I, I like what you said earlier too about how you can kind of upsell security based on how much value is stored in the wallet. I think this kind of works into this conversation too of, you know, for somebody with small amounts on a mobile phone, you know, maybe it's enough to trust the wallet developer. But if you have larger amounts, you might you might want to have multiple key servers somehow, you know, like have a multi-sig sort of setup where you have multiple organizations protecting your keys. And that's another another future option that I, I like that concept of it sort of being something that can grow with about grow with your balance maybe yeah totally um that's that's a good point um like multiple you can have multiple companies set up a key server and then kind of have um even it, like let's say a lot of people don't trust mobile uh well it's because of this whole attack vector with over the app store like there, there could be theoretically like a desktop app or something where you could bring together keys from multiple uh, key servers from different vendors. Um, that 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 would be interesting to to discuss and explore. Um, and question is, is that like that would probably be easier to use than multiple hardware wallets from different vendors, but would also have different. Uh, security trade-offs, right? I guess the problem there would still be the same app, right? So the app is still a vector. Oh, I guess you well, could have one person make the app, and then you could use two third-party key servers, something along those lines. 
Well, if you have a desktop app, you can and like you can just compile from source, right? So, like the for instance, the Lightning Wallet from Lightning Lightning Labs, we we had that uh, as an Electron app, and you could actually just go to GitHub and and compile it yourself if you didn't trust the 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 binary that was on the website. Um, and I think that's kind of the security model of uh, most desktop wallets um, that uh, you could just go to GitHub and you know make sure that there's no there's no uh, compromise there. Um, the question is, will users do that? I don't know. I, I personally think um, it's it's more of a theoretical discussion than in practice, because in practice users will just go to the app store, download it, and I don't know. Have we actually seen like a wallet developer compromise like at scale? Or I mean, I think if you have a reputable you know wallet brand then you don't like as a developer i don't know like do you really have the incentives um that that would be an interesting discussion too but um yeah i think in practice like it, it's more of a theoretical uh thing to, to download the, the source and do it i think, also I think if, if you're a hardcore bitcoiner you probably have a different setup anyway probably yeah. using a multi-sig or a glacier protocol or something like that yeah, no, that's yeah, and I think also you know yeah, wallet developers are are already basically KYC'd with the app stores that they're deploying on, so they have a you know they have an extra level of scrutiny on them, and you know for they won't be able to run away with the money as easily. So there's definitely yeah, yeah. that's a good point. <laughs> Apple Apple knows where you live, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure Google does too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, could you? Speak more to how you envision like upselling for security. Like I'm imagining that has to do with like multi-sig. Um, like how does your wallet work with other multi-sigs or to create a multi-sig? Is that is that even possible? Yeah, so actually the um the from from a, a library perspective, I use the same libraries as Blue Wallet. The um they actually do really cool, cool stuff. They have a they have an Electrum uh, light client for React Native, so I actually use that. Um, so that the, the current uh, app uses Electrum and could connect to any Electrum uh, server. And the um, I forgot about your question. Sorry. Yeah, like <laughs> um, is your is your wallet able to do like uh, multi sig basically? Yes. So yeah. So. Um, what what Blue Wallet already supports is cold card, so you can you can um, just uh, use P PSPT to to sign a, a transaction on your cold card device, and then transfer that over to uh, to your mobile device with a with an SD card. That's obviously pretty clunky UX, but I think this goes back to like um, you know the the whole upselling thing. Like once you do have a certain value, that might actually be worth the extra security. And yeah, so the idea would be to have like your mobile key be like one of the the factors, then the, the cold card be the second one, and then potentially like a recovery key or something in the cloud, or or even like a three of five, like have three hardware wallets from three different vendors, and then have one the one mobile key and the one re like recovery key in the cloud. So that, that's definitely something I'm thinking about and I'm also really interested in because I think that's that would be the way to bring like what Casa is doing around, I think, is the the most scalable UX in terms of multi-sig. You also have obviously have to trust the, the Casa app to um to not steal your funds, but I I think they're they're really onto something in terms of the, the UX for multi-sig. Yeah, have you thought about like um, like thresholds? What the dollar value threshold might be to upgrade to push people towards the next tier of security? Um, I'm thinking like you know everything, anything under like a thousand dollars, the pin is probably fine. Um, then uh, from a thousand dollars onward, the the app might upsell two factor authentication, and then like once you're at like I don't know ten thousand or whatever, it would. It would uh, ask you to up upgrade to to multi sig, um, so you basically you you buy a 
a hardware device and like a cold card and then just just add that uh to your to your setup that would be like my thinking like it but those numbers you could obviously configure and and test and like different users have different you know like what is what is a lot of money to one user is very different than what it is to another user so that's definitely something that could be configurable but yeah i think would be like it would be interesting to actually test that with when we do some ux research on this and when you say upsell are you saying like a photon wallet will sell the feature to add a 2fa and to add multi-sig and I'm not I'm not, not meaning like charging money I just mean in the sense that like in the UI it will like it will like promote hey I saw that you put in over a thousand dollars like do you want to set up two factor right so it'll just it'll just send you to the settings or just it'll send you to the the two factor setup screen um you can obviously ignore that but to just like promote promote adding more security as the the value grows yeah I wonder if there's there would even there could even be like an education where part portion where you send them to a landing page to learn more about why 2FA is more secure, why multi-sig is more secure, what's a hardware wallet, um, and include them in that process. Totally. I, that's a really good point. I think like combining this with educational content would be pretty cool. And that's also my like my like if 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 I do bring out like this wallet app, I think I would love to like obviously have a good design because right now it's like just developer uh, design, but like work with a designer that, that creates a really cool um, like branding and design. And then also adds educational content on top of that, that kind of just guides you like for like newbies, like you, you could send your, your, your parent or whatever, who's never heard of Bitcoin or just like wants to just buy a hundred dollars, send them to this website and they can like, then, uh, guide them through this step. Yeah. That's, that's really good. Cool. All right. Did anybody else have any other questions? Oh, I do. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for that presentation. That was really good. I, I do a lot of onboarding. So I, you know, this, the way of setting this up, you know, the simplicity of it, you know, I see that being very valuable um, to the, the new user. But, you know, I don't use these um, cloud storage services at all as I don't trust them so how is that set up on Google um, the, the G drive is, is that just part of your Gmail account yeah that's that's a good point like what if the user doesn't have uh, a cloud account this app does assume that the user has it because it's like the, the target user is definitely someone who you know just trusts Google I guess uh, to store their stuff the way that uh, Google Drive works is that it, you need a Google a mail account and then you just log in with your Gmail account with, to, I mean, users, Android users are logged into their, to their uh, Google account on their devices anyway. So there's no extra like account the user would need to create to, to store stuff on Google Drive. And there's just like an SDK uh, where you, you could use the, the Google Drive, um, API to, to, to upload and, and download data. Right, so, so once you're in your Google account, they give you like a, a G drive, uh, you know, right yeah. off the bat, in, you know, a small amount. If you want more, you have to pay for more. Yeah, yeah, I think it's like five gigabytes or whatever. That is like free and then you can just buy more storage if you need. Right, okay, so then if you don't have a good password on your Gmail account, then that, that's definitely a, a you know a way in for a hacker because it seems like because if I lose my phone I get a new phone all I have to do is sign into my Gmail download this app download you know the uh, the wallet and I can get my seed words in you know but by, by um, downloading the wallet and signing back into my Gmail so if my Gmail has a very weak password then that's that's an attack vector for sure. Yeah, I mean the attack would also need to to brute force the pin. So and that since that's rate limited, that would like even for a four digit pin that would take like nineteen years. Um, but yeah, like obviously that it does rely uh, to a certain extent on the on the, um, the user's password. 
would be better if I turned on the pin recovery. Um, if I turn on the pin recovery, it would like you the attack would have to wait 30 days. So um if if the user has set a, a weak password and the um and the attacker, you mean like the attacker would own that account and then just wait 30 days or Right. Well, if the attacker hacked my Gmail account password, mm -hmm. he couldn't. He wouldn't have to do anything to let me know it's been hacked. Right? He's just signing into it and downloading the app, and and um, and then doing the recovery of the, uh, the pin. And he could get in there and get that email first and delete it before I could see it. You know, but make a copy of it. Right, and so, and then just wait the thirty days. That, that's a good point, and I think that's where two-factor and and multi-sig would come in, right? So, the, the 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 single key setup is definitely for lower values, right? This is for your pocket money. Let's say you you have a mobile wallet, and you just want to have some spending money. So this is like the, for that kind of risk uh, scenario where, like, I would like. I would be totally comfortable having like a hundred dollars worth of, of money where, you know, if I lose my physical wallet, I also have that risk. And I think the risk of my, my email account getting hacked is actually quite, quite low uh, compared to my, my physical wallet getting stolen. So I think that's, that's the way I see it. Like in terms of just value to secure. Yeah. But you're a programmer. <laughs> the mm -hmm. average guy up the street, they are not good at making passwords. Maybe you should uh, yeah. recommend that people secure their Gmail accounts on, on Android or I don't know how it is for Apple, but it can, it, you know, uh, with 2FA and to remove the phone number, like also educate on how to make their, their Gmail account more secure. Because all they have to do is get rid of the, of the phone number recovery and, and maybe and get a 2FA thing. Yeah, that's a good point. That that could be part of like the educational content uh, on on the website to like uh, educate the user that you know you could take this step on on the Google and Apple side also to increase your security. I th I still think it's plenty though. It's plenty of security, like you said. If you yeah. tell the people that to you know to treat it like it's a physical wallet in your pocket, and you could get pickpocketed, right? So if they don't keep any more value in it than that, and I, I don't see a problem with any of this. I think it's great. It's kind of like Wallet of Satoshi to get into Lightning. It's just so yeah. easy and it just works. Of course, it's totally custodial, but, yeah. you know, and again, you don't want to keep too much value in there, but as an introduction to Lightning, Wallet of Satoshi is just awesome. It, as long as you make yeah. sure they understand, it's just for the introduction. Speaking yeah, yeah. Of lightning. <laughs> when yeah. are you gonna? Are you like planning on integrating lightning with your wallet? It really depends, like what users ask for. I think as long as fees are low and as long as like the use case is to store value, then like if this is like your HODL wallet, then I think lightning is less important. If to create like, I, I personally still think the the use case for payments is definitely like a very small user base and it's growing. But I think as that grows, like having a payment wallet, like specifically would also be super interesting with the seedless setup, right? So that was actually one of the, the motivations. The, the Lightning app that we did at, at Lightning Labs, we had a big problem with users um, I mean, they had wrote down the 24 word seeds and then they tried to enter those 24 words into multiple devices at once. And because the lightning channel state was only um, actually available on the one device, they couldn't recover, you know, they didn't have the, the same data on the other device. And that, that was one of the motivations behind this project actually. So the, the, not only the private key, but also you could also sync uh, the lightning channel state in in iCloud. So the the, the currently the, the the data format is just like any JSON, like any 
JavaScript object can be stored on on iCloud. So that could also include uh, obviously the seed, but also the lightning, the uh, the static backup that the the SCB that the LND currently has, or like you could also like actually update lightning uh, channel state and just sync that to iCloud. And then that would allow UX where like you just set up any device and then um, you could, uh, you, you, you probably have to be careful that you, different devices don't uh, compete with each other. But like the idea is like when you lose one device, you just have your full channel state again. Yeah, that, that's definitely something I'm thinking about. But that's um, probably probably after the, the demo hold lab. All right, I think, uh, yeah, we're over an hour, uh, I think, right now. So, Tinker, thank you so much for your presentation. And, um, man, you fielded so many questions. <laughs> we kind of grilled you a little bit, but, yeah, you took it like a champ. Yeah, thanks for having me. This was super fun.